5, verses 1 to 5, there is an open invitation. As we welcome in the new year of 2023, Isaiah says to come and eat and drink the free offer of the gospel. It tells us that God's blessing has been put into Jesus, his son Jesus Christ. Why would you go anywhere else? Only Jesus can satisfy. Only in him is eternal life. And only through him can we get to the Father. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Let us begin this morning's service with a word of prayer. Let us, let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, we praise you, for you are the one from whom all blessings flow. Indeed, you are good to us, and your mercy endures forever. Your loving kindness is great towards us, and your truth endures to all generations. As we gather for worship this morning in the brand new year, our hearts are filled with thankfulness. Thankfulness for your presence in our lives, for the way that you have so graciously sustained us throughout the year of 2022 and beyond. As we look back, we see what a faithful God you are, that you would not leave us in the debt of our sins, but have provided for us the ultimate solution through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who is our mediator and our high priest, in whom is forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. We give praise to the wonderful glories of your Son, for through him you have created all things. Worthy is he to receive blessing and honour and glory and power. Our Father, we confess our sins before you this morning. Have mercy on us. For the many times we have deliberately decided to go against your ways, for the many times we have failed to love one another, for the many times that our own hearts have deceived us, we are sorry for the way that we have failed to honour you and revere you. Help us, our God, to come before you with sorrowful and contrite hearts. We ask that your spirit work in our hearts to change us and convict us of our evil ways. Again, we thank you for the blood that was shed upon that rugged cross, that though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow, that though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We ask our God that as we draw near to you this morning, that you also may draw near to us. Be with us as we worship your holy name. Hallelujah, for you, the Lord God omnipotent reigns, but you do all things according to the counsel of your own will. We pray all this to the praise of your own glory. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's now turn to our first hymn. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer.
praise Him, praise Him.
because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs or th from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Let's turn to our next hymn. Fear us, Lord Jesus. If you would now turn with me again to the Bible, let us turn to the first Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, the first Psalm. Very first Psalm, the one, first one of 150. I'll be reading the whole of Psalm 1. But before we do that, let us again bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for your word, for it is eternal. And Lord, we ask that you help us to hide your word in our hearts, that we may not sin against you. We ask that your spirit shine brightly upon your word, so that we may understand obey, submit under it, and be able to live it out. Thank you for the power that is contained in your word and the glories that are contained in it. Lord, we ask that the words that come out of my mouth 
and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the first psalm. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Every single day, you see the world around you going to great lengths in search for happiness. There is no doubt that everyone wants to have a good life. But uh, the things that they work so hard in pursuing really going to give them a happiness that will last? Will they really be satisfied in the things that this world can offer. Some think that happiness can be obtained through money or wealth. A man says that he will be happy if he saves up a thousand dollars. He gets his thousand, but then he would like to have five thousand. He gets his five thousand, then he wants ten thousand. Even if he gets a million dollars, he will still want more. He eventually realizes that true happiness cannot be found in money. Others think that happiness can be found in having power or status. One may be elected a local councillor, but once that is achieved, he wants to be elected member of state parliament and then to federal parliament until he finally becomes the prime minister of Australia. But once he gets there, one term in office isn't enough, so he decides to be elected a second term, all the while wishing that he was the President of the United States. So you see, the more one gets, the more one wants. So let me ask you, what is it that will truly make you happy in this lifetime? What do you consider to be true blessing? What is the one thing that will give you the most meaning in this life? The very first words of the entire Psalter draws you to the possibility of having true, lasting happiness, a life that is blessed by God. Surely there is no higher state of contentment or joy. This is the divine blessedness for the truly righteous person, one whom God knows and watches over, one who has an intimate and a personal relationship with him. The 150 Psalms that make up this one book were originally compiled to serve as Israel's hymn book. It has since developed to be a hymn book for all the people of God, a hymn book for all the times. They express all sorts of emotions and desires addressed directly to God or about God and his wisdom. They contain prayers and songs and petitions that are written so honestly and deep within, from within the heart. One could not, however, read the Psalms without being constantly reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one person in whom all the Psalmist's praises, desires, hopes and feelings find their true realisation. Everything written in the law, the prophets and the Psalms are fulfilled in Jesus. To quote the famous early church father, Augustine, he said, The voice of Christ and his church was well nigh the only voice to be heard in the Psalms. He continues, 
everywhere diffused throughout the Psalms is that man whose head is above and whose members are below. It is certainly no accident or coincidence that Psalm 1 is placed first in the entire Psalter. It sets the pattern for what is to follow. It opens with a word of blessing on those whose delight is in the law of the Lord. This blessing is promised to those who love God's word, whetting your appetites to really take in every other word of the Psalms that are to follow. This psalm is not strictly a prayer or a song, but rather a declaration. It is a wisdom psalm to instruct the reader. It makes no mention of any specific historical persons or events in Israel's history. Rather, it has a timeless quality that calls God's people to obedient service. It throws out a challenge to walk diligently in the ways of the Lord and according to his law by setting out two very different ways in which one could live. These two ways are, determined, are not determined by geography or terrain, but by the character of those who choose to walk in them. So verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Immediately there is a pronouncement of true blessing. Like Jesus' sermon on the mount, the psalmist says that the blessed are attributed certain characteristics. In order to merit this blessing, one has to do something, or in this case, not do something. Hence, the blessed man is first of all defined in negative terms. The meaning of blessed refers to someone who is supremely happy or fulfilled. He has a true sense of well-being, a deep sense of joy that comes from God's grace in his life. This joy overflows to those around him as he is fully content and happy in God. There is a satisfaction in the Lord that arises from being in fellowship with him. He lives in close relation to, with God, has a trusting and a dependent relationship with him and enjoys his love and his protection. Three negative terms are used to describe the character of this blessed man. Firstly, he walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Firstly, know that there is one man in the singular, contrasted with three plural nouns, the ungodly, sinners and the scornful, making up a larger group of people. Hence, there is one person going up against the masses. He faces an uphill battle against the odds and against the trend. He certainly is not popular or appreciated. There exists a great divide between the righteous man who is blessed by God and everyone else. This deep contrast further evokes the idea that the path of the righteous is the road that is by far less travelled. It is not an easy or popular road to take. It is a narrow road that struggles against the traffic fighting against the currents of peer pressure and popular culture. Yet through all this, the psalmist says that it is still the road of blessedness and joy. As children of God living in today's culture and society, you face a very similar battle, don't you? You're often made to look like a hater and an oppressor because of your beliefs. Your stance on issues such as abortion, euthanasia, sexual identity, climate change and Black Lives Matter is all against what this society stands for. Notice also the three groups that are mentioned in the text. The blessed man does not walk, stand or sit. That's the first group. In the council, the path and the seat, the second group. And then of the ungodly Sinners and the scornful, the third group. 
Such a progression in movement depicts a regression from moving to being stationary to finally sitting. The context goes from listening to one's counsel or, adv or advice to being in the way to finally being seated with. What the psalmist is doing is portraying the impact of sin in one's life. Firstly, he may only be influenced by sin and perhaps think about trying it out. He may laugh at what people do in talk shows or watch a movie that makes sin somehow appealing. He may even look up to ungodly or sinful people, approving of the things that they do or the things that they have to say. You admire a celebrity who is clearly against God or sympathise with certain social justice issues. You find, certain, you find a certain attraction towards sinful people and sinful things. Next thing you know, you identify with sin and even participate in it from time to time. You become accustomed to sin as being natural and part of your everyday life. You stop, you take your stance with and often stand in the way of sinful things. And finally, these sinful ways eventually become a habit and a lifestyle. The attitudes of sinful people become yours and their habits, your habits. You have progressed to becoming one of the scornful, a scoffer and a mocker. Scoffers and mockers are funny people. They laugh at God and turn away from him. They laugh at the truth that are contained in his word, putting down Bible stories as perhaps fictional or farcical. They even scoff at the historicity of Christ's incarnation, denying any possibility of his resurrection. Scoffers and the scornful are missionaries of wickedness and evil. They tell jokes by calling what, what is evil good and what is good evil. So you see, a person settles into sin by stages. Before he knows it, He's caught up in a downward spiral, unable to stop or turn back, walking, standing, and then sitting. The Apostle Paul says that this sinful path will certainly lead to death, for the wages of sin is death. The blessed man has no fellowship with the wicked. Rather, his delight is in the law of the Lord. This means that his joy, pleasure, his longing, his desire, is all in the word of God. How often do you read the Bible out of compulsion or obligation? What the psalmist is saying is that there ought to be great joy and excitement when you read and meditate upon God's word. The law of the Lord is not just referring to a set of laws such as the, the Pentateuch or some abstract moral laws. Rather, it refers to God's instruction and his direction, his guidance. It forms the requirements of a covenant God, the demands of a personal sovereign God upon his subjects. It refers to who God is and the fullness of his teaching for his children. Such instruction was to be passed on from generation to generation. It was to be obeyed and loved in a positive sense, the object of reverence and devotion. The blessed man finds unspeakable joy in the entirety of God's word because he loves God and truly wants to learn how to please God. And on his law, the blessed man meditates day and night. The word meditate implies something more than just silent reflection. Strictly, it is not an internalised cognitive exercise. L literally taken, it means to whisper, to utter or to murmur. The usage points to the fact that the reading of God's law in the Old Testament was usually done out loud and in public. And verse 3, it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. In this verse, the blessed man, 
who is righteous and delights in the law of the Lord is described as a tree planted by rivers of water. The description of such a flourishing tree, abundantly supplied by rivers of water, recalls the Garden of Eden prior to the fall. Genesis chapter 2 verse 10 describes a river flowing out of Eden to water the garden. Before the fall, the state of man was holy and he was completely happy there. The Old Testament tree was a symbol of divine blessing. The blessed man here is described as a tree that has found the rivers of living water. He's planted in a location where it is well watered, ensuring that it will never fade away. The notion of being planted or transplanted involves the action of a gardener or a landscaper. Certain reasons are behind a gardener deciding to plant a tree in a particular location. Similarly, God knows the best place to plant and place his people. He chooses where they are planted for his glory and for their own good. This decision brings about God's order and a beauty in his world. There is certainly a purpose and a plan in the life of every believer. Nothing occurs by accident. God wants to use you wherever he has placed you, for you to flourish and grow, to be his ambassador and his representative to a hopeless world. And whatever God plants will surely grow and thrive, blossom and fruit. Such was the result of delighting and meditating upon the law of the Lord. Next, the psalmist states three pieces of evidence of the blessed man. Firstly, he brings forth its fruit in its season because his roots are sunk deep into the soil of a riverbed. The nourishment that this tree receives is an internal nourishment that feeds the soul of the blessed man. So it is with the enduring child of God who perseveres to the very end. God himself will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Such fruit must be evident in the lives of those who are in Christ. They must display evidence of a casting away of sin and turning away from the old self. They must also delight and meditate upon God's word. Many people today point to a mystical feeling or some kind of emotional experience for the valid validity of their conversion. They think that because they once felt emotional and grateful for the grace found in Jesus Christ, that they are now saved. However, their lives are no different to before. Others can't see any changes in them. There is no display of any spiritual fruit in their lives. A truly saved person will produce fruit in every season of life. The second evidence is that the tree's leaf does not wither. What this means is that everything that this person does has eternal value and lasting results. I recall very vividly certain parts of the life of my grandmother. She gave me a lasting memory of how to live a sacrificial and selfless life. At the time, I did not truly understand why she would always decide to serve others, honouring them before herself, even when they were clearly in the wrong. In the eyes of this world, she was a fool. She was what young people today would call a loser. She passed away at the age of 76, in my arms after a battle with cancer. I was the only one of my family there at the time. The weeks leading up to her death, her body was extremely weak, to the point that she wouldn't be able to sit up for long before having to lie back down again. But she still insisted on coming to church every Sunday. We set up a special chair 
so that she could lie down at the back of the church where she would be all rugged up and in a beanie. It was so important for her to come before God in corporate worship and praise and be amongst the congregation of the righteous. You see, her leaf did not wither. Her roots drank deeply from the streams of living water. The prophet Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 7 to 8, says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The last evidence of the blessed man is that whatever he does shall prosper. The Hebrew verb to prosper can also be translated to succeed. It infers being able to accomplish the work that one sets out to do. It also has a, a sense of making progress. It is totally different from a promise of wealth and health. In fact, have you not come to realise that in God's economy, the work that he assigns you to do tends to truly prosper only through suffering and humiliation? As you look back to the hurdles and the struggles that you have faced in your life, you realise that you always come out the other end a much stronger person. God has used these experiences to shape you and to mould you. He wants to prepare you for the marriage feast of the Lamb that you have been invited to. God's blessing in all your suffering and perseverance for him is the promise that none of this is without a purpose. None of it is pointless. Regardless of what may confront you in life, Every single bud of yours will grow into a grain if you allow God to sit enthroned as your true king. As he reigns over every aspect of your life, you will surely flourish and bear fruit at the right time. The harsh and hostile environment created by the wicked in this world cannot extinguish the flame of the righteous. God will make you blossom and bear fruit no matter your age, your abilities, your background or your past. The trees that he has planted will most certainly grow and thrive because they are watered from the river of life. As you come to understand God's blessing, you will know that you should strive towards living this holy and righteous life. At the same time, however, if you're honest with yourself, you'll admit that all too often you also listen to the counsel of the ungodly and secretly laugh at God through your lack of faith or unbelief. The issue is further complicated in that the grammar of verse 1 requires this man's perfect obedience. The Hebrew verbs to walk, to stand and to sit are all in the perfect mood, meaning that the blessed man is he who has never sinned or been involved in anything tainted with evil. The blessings of this first psalm are for those who are and always have been separated from wickedness and sin. So is the psalmist tempting you with something that you can never have or achieve? Or is it referring to the afterlife whereby everything will be perfect? There has only been one man in the entire history of the human race who has been able to live out this, the, rea the reality of this psalm. Very amazingly, the very first verse of the entire Psalter points to Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus do we see this psalm exemplified. There was no sin in him. No lies came out of his mouth. And there was no deceit in his heart. He is the only one who delights fully in the law of the Lord. He went about his father's business, 
speaking all the words that he was given and doing all the works that the Father set before him. At the appointed hour, he underwent the most severe suffering. He was shamed, beaten and spat on. The Roman soldiers humiliated him and crucified him. He drank the full cup of God's wrath and did everything in its right season. In all that he did, he prospered because he fully fulfilled the Father's will in perfect obedience. Jesus truly was the supremely happy and blessed man. And as members of Christ's body, you know that all this is in your measure. Though conscious that Christ alone comes up to the picture drawn so beautifully here. Having the imputed righteousness of Christ, you too can have this holiness imparted to, to you. His blessings become yours. His life wrapped up in yours and yours in his. To be able to live out this psalm, you need to become like Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore the fact that this involves living a life of sacrifice and humility. And just as the word of God was central in the life of Christ, so it must be central to all those who belong to him. A sure sign that you genuinely belong to Jesus is to have a real hunger and thirst for his word. It is like oxygen or food. You won't be able to live without it. Remember that you live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you so much for the promises that are contained in your word. We thank you for the blessings that are found in your Son, only in your Son, Jesus Christ. That through the shedding of his blood, Lord, we too may become righteous before you and in your sight. How unworthy we are, our God, for we know of our deceitfulness, we know of our wickedness and our going astray. Lord, we thank you for the righteous, perfect righteousness that is found through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us, our God, to firm, uh, wholly firm fast to this truth to be able to live our lives as those who are truly blessed. Help us to love you more this year and to love one another more before ourselves. We thank you again, Lord, for allowing us to begin this year of 2023 before you. What a blessing it truly is. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen.